my name is Jessica Fitzhanso, and I'm a librarian here at the Chelmsford Library. And now I'll get started uh, just introducing tonight's speaker. Um, Steve Hill holds university degrees in marine biology, evolutionary biology, and ecology. He's lived in New Hampshire for over 20 years and has explored most of the state. An avid hiker, birder, and experienced naturalist, Steve loves to share his experience and knowledge with others, especially children and others eager to learn. In April 2016, Steve formed Open World Explorers to more fully share his knowledge and experience in ecology, ornithology, and earth science, and to help others find personal value in the natural history and landscape of the area. And you can learn more about him and his organization at www.openworldexplorers.com. And tonight, he will be offering tips on identifying our resident and migrant feathered friends and letting us know what to feed them to attract a diverse population. So thank you so much for everybody for joining us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm gonna allow Steve to share his screen and um, go right ahead. Okay, so I hope everyone can hear me. I'll get feedback from Jessica and um, let me introduce myself again. My name is Steve Hale, and um, I am the uh, owner and operator of Open World Explorers. I've been giving presentations like this to audiences probably for 10 to 15 years. It all started back uh, at a time when the University of New Hampshire, which is where I have a full-time job, um, had something called the UNH Speakers Bureau, and libraries and clubs and hotels could reach out to university for different expertise to come and speak and share with uh, their audiences and things like that. And um, one of my particular areas of expertise is on birds. So that is uh, what I like to speak on. Um, I got my PhD at the University of New Hampshire studying uh, birds, in particular a bird called Bicknell's thrush which lives up in the White Mountain National Forest, up in the high elevation zone. So I'm going to, to guess that a number of you are also hikers and have also been up into the spruce fir forests of the White Mountains and seen those birds. But uh, other things I do for open world explorers besides these talks is I do guided bird watching trips and things. And actually this morning I, I guided a family on a private birding trip where we social distanced and had masks and everything and we went out and uh, we found 40 species of birds in two hours, many residents and migrants and many of those birds that we saw on our trip today, uh, well when I say trip it was really right around their yard and the fields near their house, are birds that are featured in this presentation as well. Before we dive in um, about the structure of this talk, when the slides come up, there's nothing that indicates what the species identification for the bird is. So when the, when the slide comes up, I want you all, if you're willing and um, courageous, to type into the chat box what species you think it is. And then um, Jessica will read out for us what some of those responses were, and then we will triangulate on um, narrowing down the identification so everybody comes away knowing what it is and why it is what it is, okay? Um, this talk will focus on backyard birds, but as you all know, not everybody's backyard is the same. Some people have urban, might have an urbanized backyard, some may be more suburban, and some even rural with fields, hay fields, large expansive fields, gardens, and things like that. So we will talk about uh, birds in a variety of different types of backyards. But for the most part, you will find these birds at some time or another in backyards throughout Massachusetts and New England, okay? Um, we will talk about birds also that don't necessarily come to feeders. So this is not just about feeding birds, but there will be a large part of the presentation at the end that is devoted to feeding birds and can give tips on how to increase the diversity of birds in your own yard. Okay. Well, so, you can ask me for any password, like you said. With that, we have our opening slide here. Um, and can, it, can this is kind of to warm everybody up. What is this bird? What are some of the guesses on this bird? 
that the results are coming in. Oh, and actually I can see the chat, Jessica. Oh, that's excellent. I was just about to say, it looks like but, we've got mostly Robin. Yeah, but it, let me ask you, Jessica, a quick technical question. Um, are you seeing my chat box opened on the screen? Because I'm sharing my no. screen. You're only seeing no. the presentation? Okay, yep. good, good. That's so yes, right? yes, we have Robin as all of the answers. The American Robin, very good. So that was a good one to warm up with. This is a migratory bird that visits our backyards. But uh, how many of you are aware that uh, robins, which are known or famous for being migrants, many of them actually don't migrant, migrate. And there are many of them that spend year round, even through the deepest winters and some of the harsh winters in uh, uh, Northern New England. So robins are around, um, can be found all the time. When it's wintry cold and there's three feet of snow on the ground, rather than bouncing on your lawn, they hang out in wetlands and places like that where there's lots of fruit left over from the previous fall, and that's what they subsist on. So we normally think of them as foraging in our yards for worms, but in the wintertime they can go for fruit and uh, that helps them get through the winter. Many of them do head down to the golf courses in South Florida too. Okay, so maybe I need to do, I'm not able to, oh, okay, good. So the first group of birds we're gonna handle are, what these are birds that do not regularly go to bird feeders. In fact, they almost never use bird feeders. And as a biologist, biology is my training discipline, um, one of the things you learn is to never say never, because as soon as you say never, there will be an example that comes up that contradicts you. So almost never do these birds use feeders. All right, let me see if I can get Use open spaces of our yards, the lawn or the air for foraging, but they aren't necessarily using uh, feeders. They very often do use um, uh, our homes, or landscaping around our homes for nesting, or they could be just passing through. So now if you can in your chat box, go ahead and enter what you think this bird is. Let's see what some of the results come up to be. Margaret, please mute. Sorry. Okay, I see a lot of people entering cat bird. Okay. Consensus seems to be the gray catbird. And that is correct. This is the gray catbird. These are famous for nesting in the shrubs, landscaped shrubs around our homes, often right outside our window. I remember growing up in Pennsylvania, looking out my bedroom window into the rhododendron right outside, and I could look down into the gray catbird nest that was nesting there. So if many of you or some of you are bird watchers, um, you'll notice the gray catbird is gray overall with a black cap and a very black tail. A feature you might not have noticed so much is what we call the red underpants that the gray catbird has. And uh, sometimes if uh, you have a, a gray catbird around, you can take on the challenge to uh, try to find and observe uh, this feature on the uh, undertail coverts. These are called undertail coverts of this bird, um, displaying this red, red maroon color. There's a question that says, are these related to robins? They are not clo closely related to robins. These are actually more closely related to mockingbirds. In the east, uh, eastern United States, east of the Mississippi, the three near relatives are in this group are called the mimids, the mockingbird, the brown thrasher, and the gray catbird. Those are those form a, a group. The mimids, or you might read that as mimics. Okay. Very good. How about this fine looking fellow? Very brown, not very flashy or distinctive. Um, what do you guys think about this? 
Essie, Wren, whoever's, if, if you're going to put Wren, that's fine. Go ahead and put Wren. But if you can, challenge yourself to identify what kind of Wren it is. We have about five different uh, Wrens, four to five. We have House Wren, Carolina Wren, Winter Wren here in the east. There are some others out west uh, as well, okay? So this bird, so there's a good point here. Please, Steve, can you give an idea of the size? Um, this bird uh, is probably about five inches from tip of the tail to the tip of the bill. I'm, I'm surmising. It's definitely smaller than a robin, uh, probably about the size of a chickadee, this bird. It is a wren. This is the house wren, okay? It is a long-tailed wren. Wrens are notable and characteristic. Jessica, I'm gonna ask you real quickly. When I slide my cursor on the screen, can you see that? I'm sliding my, okay, good. So when wrens often hold their tail cocked at a, in a near vertical position, and the house wren doesn't always do that, but it does sometimes lift it up that, in that way. Not as much as birds like the uh, Carolina wren or the winter wren, which we have here. Um, the examples that I'm giving are typically males, yes, but often the case in winter, in these house wrens, for example, they are, um, the males and females are similar, as is the case with the gray catbird. Uh, you can't really tell them um, by looking at them, tell them apart. We will go over some examples uh, also that do have uh, male and female differences. So those are very good questions. But um, a noteworthy thing about the wrens is they are, well, this wren, the house wren, is a cavity nester. That means it nests in holes. And it is famous for nesting in these um, birdhouses that have the very small holes and they're usually hung from a tree, something like that. And they will fill the hole, fill the hole or the house with sticks and things like that. I mentioned I grew up in Pennsylvania, and I remember very well um, my mom telling me to go out to clean out the paper box. Now, some of you who are a little bit younger might not know what a paper box is because many people don't have newspapers delivered to their homes anymore. But the paper box was a special open box that was just below the mailbox where the mail or where the paper boy or girl would put the newspaper in. Well, the house wren would fill that with sticks, uh, making a kind of a fake nest. They often build fake nests um, in a territory and they only use one. So, but this is the house wren. Um, there's a very good chance if you live in a kind of suburbanized yard um, or even urbanized, you could have house wrens nesting around your house in some in some holes, um, either uh, birdhouses that you've put up or some even natural cavities. This is one of my favorite, and I'll mention that these photos, um, these are not my photos, I'm a horrible photographer. I'm usually busy with my binoculars and not fidgeting with cameras, but this is a photograph. It looks to me like it's a painting, but it's a photo. This is one of my favorite birds and I see the results coming in People seem to be familiar with this. This is the cedar waxwing, okay? Um, they are noteworthy and you might've seen them in other magazines or seen them in the field for yourself. They often have a crest. And this, in this individual, the crest is uh, flattened on the head and nape, um, but often that is held out and, and appears as a crest. They have a, a distinctive black mask this bird um, is smaller than a robin, um, but larger than a chickadee or sparrow. Um, so in, in between in those size. Distinctive for um, the waxwings, we do have two species of waxwings in North America. One of them, it really only comes and visits us in the winter time, um, and that happens irregularly. But this, uh, this one, 
the cedar wax wing. So a number of you got this one correct. Um, both wax wing species look like they've perched in, on a bucket of yellow paint. And this one's got his tail dipped in the yellow paint and flew away. And now it's per permanently marked. Of course, that's not what happened. This is the natural coloration of this bird and uh, helps identify it. We call this a yellow terminal tail band. Uh, and that's a diagnostic feature for the wax wings. And then uh, cedar wax wings are our common one, and they're a common bird in and around our homes and suburban gardens and places like that. Very good, so cedar wax wing, okay? But we don't often find the, any of the birds we've talked about very often using feeders. How about this guy, does he use feeders? Well, he uses feeders indirectly because, of course, this is an owl. And um, these owls, they do eat other birds. So they can be attracted to bird feeders um, and squirrels and chipmunks. Things that are using and eating the bird food uh, can attract these predators. So this is an owl. And I see a number of um, indications for barn owl but I am going to share that this is not a barn owl. This is in fact a barred owl. And normally when I give this presentation live, I have to clarify the barred owl um, is not the same thing as Shakespeare's owl, Shakespeare the bard. It's the barred owl because of these vertical lines or bars uh, on its chest. Okay, so this is the barred owl. This is probably the most common owl in New England and certainly in northern Massachusetts and around the Chelmsford area. This will be the most common um, owl and it's the one you often hear at night with your windows open. Now there are also other owls. Great horned owl is another one that is common and there can be eastern screech owls which is a smaller owl. But this one is the most abundant a quick observation about this, if you can follow my cursor on the screen, you'll see the face is divided kind of in two, two circular halves. And you don't really get to appreciate this in three dimensions, but these facial discs are approximately shaped like a parabola. And you might know, you might see as you drive around your neighborhood, and some of you might have parabolic dishes for direct TV or other things. And you know that there are parabolic dishes that uh, physicists and astrophysicists use for collecting radio signals. And the characteristic of a par parabola is when incoming um, radiation strikes the parabola, it reflects through a common point, a focal point. And in these parabolic dishes, the approximate focal point also coincides with a, uh, a location near where the external ear is, the ear opening. Now, these are birds. They don't have external ears like mammals do, but a pinna, what's called a pinna, the fleshy outer part of the ear. They just have a hole on the side of their head and it's concealed by the feathers. But these parabolic dishes help to focus that uh, sound, incoming sound, and that helps to give them outstanding hearing. Okay, so this is the barred owl. Can you put in your chat box uh, a real quick feedback? How many of you have um, heard or seen barred owl around your house? I uh, had a question. Uh, do all owls have parabola? Um, no, they do not all have par par parabolic dishes. An example of one that does not is a snowy owl, which we see out on the seacoast um, and um, Plum Island and coastal Massachusetts areas in the wintertime. Um, typically, there are some owls that are actually diurnal or more, the word is crepuscular, more active at dawn and dusk, and they will have to a lesser extent these facial discs. And um, there are some tropical owls that uh, do not have these discs as well either. Um, I'll tell this story also. 
where there was an experiment done, not with the barred owl, but with the barn owl, ending in N, where they put the barn owl in an experimental room. Um, they closed all the doors, turned out the lights, and it was complete, it was made so no light could be in the box. They push an electronic trigger, which releases a mouse, and then they come back later and uh, the mouse is gone and only the owl is there. So in complete darkness, this owl was able to uh, locate the mouse, um, uh, demonstrating that they can use their hearing to do this. I'll mention, now a number of you mentioned that this might be a barn owl, and I'll just say that barn owl has a very restrictive range in um, Massachusetts. Um, it's restricted to the most southern Massachusetts and also to uh, Martha's Vineyard and those outer islands. But uh, northern Massachusetts, uh, to my knowledge, does not have barn owls. Okay, if there are some of you who um, live in urban and suburban settings, you might see this guy. Now this is really blown up and enlarged because this is, this is a small bird in real life. Um, probably the size of a, uh, I don't want to give it away. Uh, and the size of, let's say a small thrush, like a hermit thrush, uh, definitely smaller than a robin, maybe a little bigger than a sparrow, but it's very long winged. Yep. And, um, a lot of people will identify this as a swallow, but it's not a swallow. It has similar habits as a swallow, but note it's very chunky and it looks, appears as if it has no tail. It actually does have a tail. And if you see, if you see my cursor here, and I don't know how your image comes up on your screen, you can see little bristles coming off the tail that this bird uses to perch inside of chimneys and, and other structures because it hangs on the side with its feet and then it'll dig those bristles in underneath of it to help prop it and cantilever onto the side of the structure. So there's some observations. It looks like a fish with wings. Yep, that's very good. I like to think of these guys as flying cigars. It looks kind of like one of these homemade cigars. And if you notice, um, oh, thank you, Isabel, that you can see the bristles. I'm glad you can see that. Um, when they, these guys fly, they fly, very, they fly very high, higher than swallows typically fly. And it looks as if they flap their wings alternately, one at a time, but very fast. So when you look at their flight, it looks very chaotic and erratic. They do often fly in groups and they make chitter chatter sounds as they're flying around. Often in mill towns, you will find uh, chimney Swiss because there's lots of old chimneys that they can use and things like that. So, um, uh, so that's the chimney swift. We often see them flying up uh, over our yards, but um, I've never seen one of these birds perched in my life. Um, Never seen one land, I've only seen them in flight. They're catching insects on the wing. That's how they feed. They fly around catching insects, and boy, aren't we thankful for them in bug season. We need more chimney swifts. And um, I do not know why they flap their wings alternately like that. And it may be that it's uh, an illusion, that it appears that they're flapping like that. Um, but I don't know and I haven't heard anything that it confers any aerodynamic advantage for them. This is a handsome bird. I love these guys. Um, if you don't know what bird this is, what family do you think it is in? Okay, so a number of answers here. Flicker and woodpecker, northern flicker. Okay, you guys are all over this. This is the northern flicker. And it is a woodpecker. So everybody who put woodpecker is correct. And everyone who put northern flicker is even more correct. And specifically, this is a type of northern flicker called the yellow shafted flicker. 
which it gets its name for the yellow feather shafts on, on these feathers. There's also yellow feather shafts on the tail feathers as well. You can't see them in this uh, individual over here. But these are the yellow shafted flickers. This is a woodpecker. We have about seven species of woodpecker in uh, northern New England that we regularly see. Uh, more if you count things like blackback woodpecker, which is up in the far north of uh, New Hampshire and uh, northern New England and the uh, three-toed woodpecker. But this woodpecker is the one that is most likely to be found on the ground. We often associate woodpeckers with being on the sides of the trees or bouncing along branches looking for insects. But the yellow shafted flicker is actually a woodpecker, but it eats a lot and spends a lot of its foraging time on the ground. How many people have had uh, northern flickers in your yard? Let's see how many people have had that. Yep, yep, there's a couple coming in. Yep, oh yeah, there's a lots of yes, yes, yes. Now very often, one thing to be mindful of is that woodpeckers, um, they like to eat in fields and grass, and if they're coming to your yard often, it could be an indi indicator that you've got grubs that you actually are supporting a flicker feeder in your yard. So you might wanna check it and see if you've got grubs because, uh, and now I'm not, and I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna say grubs are a bad thing because the flickers love them and a whole lot of other wildlife love grubs as well. You might have a couple uh, spots where skunks or raccoons come in and dig up the grubs as well. But flickers certainly appreciate it. Uh, one of my favorite woodpeckers. Here's a nondescript uh, bird. This is uh, um, a little bit smaller than a robin, actually probably quite a bit smaller than a robin, definitely bigger than a chickadee. Um, you see it feeding its young, so a grasshopper here. Okay, we've got some guesses coming in. These are a little more, um, um, moved around, we've got swallow, phoebe, sparrow, barn swallow, okay. Um, I wanted you to notice something here in this. Uh, this structure here is an eave. Where I grew up in Pennsylvania, we call this an eave, E-A-V-E. I know when I ask this question to live audiences, they'll call it a soffit, and I, I take their word for it that it's a soffit. Um, these birds are notorious for nesting underneath some kind of roof um, or sheltered situation, under a deck, under an eave of a roof. I believe this nest is being built on a vent, uh, some kind of uh, uh, kitchen exhaust vent or something like that. And they will build this nest over and over um, over many years, and it builds up over time. Uh, nondescript looking bird, very long tail. When we see this bird perched on a wire or a branch, it very often it will flick its tail. And this is the Eastern Phoebe. It's in the flycatcher family, okay? So it is an insectivore primarily, but there are a number of flycatchers that visit and live in northern um, Massachusetts and migrate through northern, New Ham uh, northern Massachusetts. But the Eastern Phoebe is the one that has flexibility to also eat fruit. And at my feeder here, I live in, in Barrington, New Hampshire, near the seacoast. At my suet feeders, during these, uh, these cold, rainy days we had uh, through uh, April, uh, was, was taking advantage of the suet very much. Uh, but normally they like to eat insects. Like I said, it's in the flycatcher family. So that's what they like to do. So Eastern Phoebe. How many people have had this nesting on your house or around your house? Anyone? Okay, not too many takers on this. A neighbor did and yes. Okay, no, no. Okay, so got some mixed results. Um, sometimes, so be on the lookout. They'll nest on um, lamp 
posts and things like that. Uh, is or the the sconce sconce or torch lights that are often by your front door. All right, now this is the uh, the raptor bird of prey, most likely to be associated uh, with our yards, or at least in a notable way that we'll see it, because this is our largest hawk that we have in the area. And a number of you have gotten this right. This is the red-tailed hawk. Uh, and here you can see it's chestnut colored or maroon or rust colored tail. It really isn't red. It's more of an orange rust color, okay? But we often will see this soaring over our yards. If we're fortunate to live in an agricultural area where there's farm fields with woods adjacent, you might see these guys perched on the side. They like to hunt um, small mammals in the middle of the field. They do not really eat a lot of big mammals. Um, they'll eat a rabbit and things like that, but, but I see mostly them eating small bowls and things like that. But um, I want to tell you how to identify them a little bit too. Um, for the hawks in our region, this hawk, notice the, this splash of dark across the belly. We call that the belly band, okay, the belly band. So the red-tailed hawk is actually white or clean chested, and it's white or clean um, down below the belly in this ventral area here, and then it's got this splash of dark. This is highly variable. Some of these, um, will this splash of dark will actually look very light. Um, Alejandro says, how big is it? Uh, it's pretty big, so uh, which is not a good answer. Um, its wingspan is probably over four feet across, and um, body size-wise, it's smaller than a turkey, um, larger than uh, um, what's a good comparator for a red-tailed hawk? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to think about that uh, a little more. But this is our largest hawk. Um, not to be, oh, oh, there's good, raven. It's about the size of a raven, uh, or maybe a little larger, bulkier than a raven. So that's good. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for uh, that question. We also had another um, question before that one. Do red-tailed yeah. hawks socialize? Sorry. Do they do hawks socialize? So um, by socialize, uh, Ryan asked this question. I'm going to take to mean, um, do they communicate with others, not necessarily in their family group? And do they cooperate and tolerate each other and maybe assist each other? And I'm going to say for the most part, I am not aware of red-tailed hawks being social. Um, and for the most part, hawks are not social you know, at least outside their family group. A male and female, of course, will be social and in raising their young in a nest. Now, an exception to that, if anyone's been out west, southwestern United States, there are uh, Harris hawks there, and those are uh, exceptionally and highly social and highly cooperative in, in their hunting. But red-tailed hawks, as far as I know, um, are not social. Okay. Red-tailed hawk. This is our largest hawk in our skies. Um, and I'm not counting osprey or eagle in that statement. I'm separating those out. Or turkey vulture. Those would all be examples of large soaring birds that are larger than a red-tailed hawk. Okay. Good. Okay. So again, we're still birds uh, that do not typically uh, go to feeders. And we'll, we'll wrap this section up here pretty quickly. But this bird, what do you think this is, everyone? Red-tailed hawks do often nest in the same place each year. They do reuse their nests. Good question. So the results are coming in. You guys are nailing this. This sometimes confuses my audiences. Um, they don't always get this one. This is, in fact, a northern mockingbird. This is a relative of the gray catbird and the brown thrasher. And um, I'm going to give you a little sound demo 
on how to tell the northern mockingbird from the brown thrasher, which is not showing in this uh, presentation, and the gray catbird. So northern mockingbirds, and what I'm about, I'm going to do this with myself, and I'm not a good imitator, and I'm not making any real bird sounds. I'm just demonstrating the pattern and cadence of, of what the mockingbirds do. Northern mock mockingbirds repeat their phrases in at least threes, like this. D, 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 whoop, 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 G, 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 does not really repeat its things at all. And I'm not gonna try to do that because I'll sound like nonsense, but it does not have any repeatable pattern. And I think the best thing it sounds like when it's singing for the great catbird is it sounds like R2D2 going in all kinds of different directions with beeps and whistles and things. Of course, the great catbird also has its characteristic mew sound, which sounds almost like a cat uh, doing a meow, okay? So that's the Northern Mockingbird. A lot of us have uh, those around our house, our, our homes as well. This bird we often find flying over fields near us. If you happen to live in more of a rural setting or if you have large yards, you'll see these guys nesting. Note the very long wings, okay? Very long wings. And then even further out, if you see these two elements, these are the outer tail feathers, or ta we call them tail streamers, that give this bird its characteristic name, swallow, the swallow tail. And this is the barn swallow. It will nest on um, barns and sheds and in rafters and up under um, porch decks and things like that. And it's like the swift, it's an insect forager. It feeds on um, flying insects. Anything that feeds predominantly on flying insects, you can surmise or put together for yourself, it's got to be a migrant because there are no flying insects in the wintertime. You can pretty much determine whether a bird is going to be a migrant or a partial migrant or a resident based on what it eats. Because if there's not food around, it can't stay. If there is food around, it typically can stay, okay? How about this gem? This is one of the, uh, the groups of birds prized by bird watchers, okay? It's not a finch. Yep, it's a warbler, okay? It's a warbler. What kind of warbler? Anyone know? Okay, here we got some guesses. Yellow warbler. Yep, this is the yellow warbler. Okay, now there are about 17 different species of warbler, maybe more actually, maybe 20 or so on some years that will fly through our, our area on migration. Many of them are, some are still migrating through right now. Um, but come June, early June, then we, we kind of consider things are in place for breeding and things like that. But the yellow warbler is the most common warbler in around our yards. Uh, in open spaces with some interspersed trees and shrubs. And they're very beautiful and have a very beautiful song. This is a male yellow warbler. He also has these rust uh, or maroon reddish color streaks on his chest, okay? So um, if you do some bird walking or bird watching around your home, there's a very good chance. If you see a bright yellow bird, you have two possibilities either American goldfinch or yellow warbler for birds that are predominantly all yellow and, and on a small body size. Margaret asked, what does it sound like? Well, it sings a song and it sounds, um, I'm gonna try to imitate it a little bit. It says, sweet, sweet, little more sweet, very rapidly. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Now it doesn't say those exact words, but 
the pattern and cadence again is what to listen to. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. Sometimes it might be a little shorter. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Sweet, sweet, little more sweet. And it'll repeat it over and over again. Um, so when you, um, uh, what bird sounds like he's saying he did it? Uh, I'm not sure. I'll have to think about that. While we go on through the slides, Levi, I will be trying to think who says he did it. He did it. Maybe if that's what you mean, I don't know. Okay, now we're going to do some more non-feeder birds, but these birds um, sometimes use feeders, but they might also be attracted to the spoil pile underneath the, uh, the feeder. Okay, how about this one? It's a popular one that a lot of you may know. What do you think? Dove? What kind of dove, John Carla? Here we go, morning dove. Now, some of you are writing morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, and some are writing M-O-R-N-I-N-G. So it is not the dove of the early morning, it's the sad dove. If you've listened to its song, its wail, wailing song, it sounds like it's uh, sad, and that's the morning dove. These guys can often be found underneath your feeder eating the seed that has been spilled out by other birds. How many people have seen this on your bird feeder? I hope you didn't see it on your bird feeder because then you're going to need another bird feeder. Yeah, wild turkey. Very good. Number of you are indicating that you've had wild turkey in your yard. It's very nice to see. Very beautiful when these males are displaying and uh, we are seeing those this time of year with the males all puffed out trying to impress the ladies. I always think it's funny because whenever I see that, it looks absolutely like the females are not interested at all in anything that's going on. So yeah, wild turkey, very good. It's good to see everybody who's seen these. Here's some eye candy for everyone. How about these? Bluebird, yeah. Eastern bluebird, thanks Giancarla. Yep, the bluebird of happiness, love it. So this is a male on the left and a female on the right. The females are, are more subdued in their coloration, not nearly as bright, and the males much more extensive in their blue. There are, of course, cavity nesters, as many of you are probably aware, and will readily go into a bluebird box uh, um, to nest. But these guys can be found in feeders, and even more so nowadays, feeding with mealworms has become very popular. So before feeding with mealworms, um, uh, these guys would not really be coming to feeders very much at all, but now that there are mealworm feeders, uh, we can get them. So Alejandro asks, um, is the one on the right a female? And yes, that is correct, Alejandro. The one on the right is the female. Uh, it's a little more drab. As a general rule in ornithology, the males typically are brighter, more showy than the females. This is not always the case. There are some examples in the parrots where the reverse is true, and some examples in some of the shorebirds where the reverse is true. Um, but uh, these guys do sometimes come to our feeders and uh, partake in seed. They're in the thrush family, so they're closely related to the robin. Now here we have two birds on this slide. I bet everybody knows the one on the left. What's the one on the left? Red-winged blackbird, here it comes, very good. Okay, now get ready for the next one. What's the one on the right? Okay, Alona's got it, Alejandro's got it. Yeah. Micah's got it, Isabel's got it. So these are red-winged blackbirds and the one on the left is the male and the one on the right is the female. And this is a really good example of what's called sexual dimorphism. So sexual refers to the genders, male and female. Di is a prefix that means two, and morph means form. So there are two sexual forms here, males and females. Humans are sexually dimorphic. There are a lot of um, animals that are sexually dimorphic. There are even plants that are sexually dimorphic. Um, 
It's, all it means is that there are different forms for the males and females. Notable in birds is that there are many that are also not sexually dimorphic. Gray catbird was one that we gave an example of before, uh, that you can't tell them apart. Okay, now we're going to get into our section on feeder birds, um, and we can talk about some of the uh, things on identifying these. Well, what do we got here? This is always a favorite. Yeah, Alejandro, there are female and male plants. One of the most common ones or familiar ones I, I know of are holly plants are males and females. There are also some trees that are males and females. So yes, this is the hummingbird, but which hummingbird? How many species of hummingbirds can we have in our area? Who can answer that question? John Carla says one. Ilona says one, Linda says one. Results are racking up that there's only one species of hummingbird, and that is in fact true. For the most part, this, if you made the statement there's one species of hummingbird east of the Mississippi River, for the most part, you would be true. There are places now in Louisiana um, where uh, Rufus hummingbird is establishing more and more uh, east of the Mississippi River, but that's very limited. So ruby-throated is our hummingbird. If you see one, uh, it's most likely going to be that. There are records in our area of Rufus hummingbirds showing up, um, um, but they are very rare. So ruby-throated hummingbird. And of course, you can feed hummingbirds with a sugar solution, four parts water, one part sugar, okay? You can mix that yourself. You do not need to buy it in a store. And please do not use red dye. It is completely unnecessary. It does not attract them, okay? Does not attract them any more than the other structures adorning a hummingbird feeder would. So please do not use the red dye, okay? Um, I would recommend also that if you do feed hummingbirds, you change your water once a week at least. And some people say once every four days. Okay, because uh, especially during these hot days, fungus and bacteria can build up in there uh, as well. Okay, so um, Micah, I have a feeder up and I'm waiting for a hummer to come by too. The sad thing is all my neighbors have hummingbirds coming or they're, they're sending me pictures and I don't have one to show anybody else. So uh, mine's a dud so far, but ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, here's a kind of notorious uh, identification um, problem. So before you put your answers in, I'm going to ask you to pause. Don't put your answers in yet because the top panel is different species from the bottom panel, okay? So I'm going to ask you, ask everyone to say what you think. Well, first of all, I'm going to reveal to everyone that this identification challenge is between the purple finch and the house finch, okay? Purple finch and house finch. How many people, tell me what you think the top panel species is. Is it purple or house? Okay, we'll see how these results come in. Okay, oh, they're looking about mixed. Okay, maybe leaning a little towards purple, maybe. It's pretty balanced, okay? So we'll say half of you say, I think there's a lot of people who didn't vote on this also. Some fence sitters in the audience, not able to commit either way. So the, the species at the top is in fact the purple finch, and the one down below is the house finch. I'm gonna tell you quickly some ways you can identify these. First of all, um, it's subtle in this image, but hopefully you can see it. But you see in these feather coverts, these top feathers, do you see that there's some purple and red in these feathers with the brown? And also on the back, do you see the back brown feathers also have some purplish red in them? Can you see that? Somebody say yes or no, a couple of you, if you can see that. See, Andrea can see it. Um, yeah, a bunch of you can see that. So the purple finch has these reddish purple colors, and this is more of a, a deep, a deep purplish, almost a maroon color. 
Um, but this is infused in the back and on the wings with the browns. If you look at this male house finch down here, the reds are separate from the browns. The browns of this wing, there's a little bit of a white wing bar, but there's really no reds here. There's no red on the back. The red is much more restrictive. It's important to know that distribution because sometimes the reds can be difficult to see or distinguish. It's hard to say if something is dark enough red or light enough red. Another good way to tell this, tell these finches, is to look at the females too. So here's a female purple finch. Notice the dark contrast between the darks and the whites on the purple finch. The brown is very dark brown and the white is very light white. On these house finches, the brown is kind of a lighter brown. It's finer streaked. There's more streaks, finer, and the white is more of kind of a dingy white. It's not as an immaculate uh, white. Um, purple finches will eat seeds, Andrea. Um, all kinds of seeds. Now they also eat some insects. All of these birds are also eating insects in their diets also this time of year because they need protein, better source of protein, but they do eat seeds quite a bit. So, and the uh, female purple finch also has this white eye line, whitish, or it's even sometimes it's kind of a pale, uh, even there's a yellow or creamy tint to it. Um, and the uh, female lady house finches lack that. Okay, so now once you get that distinction down, I'm gonna tell you how to identify another uh, bird that can be difficult. If you see a bird that looks like this female purple finch show up at your feeder and it's giant, like really big, almost twice the size of this female purple finch, but looks just like it, then it's gonna be a female rose-breasted grosbeak. Okay, female rose-breasted grosbeak. Okay. So purple finch, house finch, on we go. Now, these species here, there's three different birds that come to our feeders. They all like this little seed called black niger, or sometimes it's called thistle. It's, I, I like to think of it as the Cadillac of bird seed because it's much more expensive than uh, the other types of seed, okay? But here on the left, we see these bright yellow uh, individuals with the black head and the black wings. Okay, I see you guys are chiming in that this is the goldfinch. That's right, this is the American goldfinch. Out west there are different goldfinches like lesser goldfinch and Lawrence's goldfinch. But here in the east we have American goldfinch. There's a female here, okay. These are, all these birds on this slide are all closely related. They're in the same genus. How about this one? It's clearly different than the goldfinch. It's heavily streaked, brown, not very colorful, but it does have some yellow here in the wing. So I have to point that out because it's often, it's, it's subtle, okay? Anybody know what this is? This is not a red pole. Anybody else have any guesses? Okay. So first we got the American goldfinch. Oh, I gave that one away too soon. This is the pine siskin. Pine siskin, and then these other ones over here are the common red poles. They all like this seed. They have similar bills and can extract it from these very small holes. These pine siskins and common red poles, we often refer to them as northern finches. They breed far to our north and come down in some winters, okay? They're rare in many winters, but in some winters they come down in great numbers. Pine siskins actually nest in the White Mountain National Forest, so they're not too far away. You can go up in any summer and find pine siskins, but the uh, common red poles nest much farther to the north. How about this guy? Anybody recognize him? There you go, the blue jay, very good. They like tray feeders. Those uh, feeders with um, uh, little um, perches are often too small and confining for blue jays. So they like to either eat off the ground or um, eat out of a tray feeder. 
uh, they can actually stuff their cheeks with lots of seeds at, at one time and then fly away and hide them, things like that. Okay. The blue jay. Okay, here's another identification challenge. Okay. Um, do they like thistle? I do not know that Noah Blue Jay is liking thistle particularly. Okay, so we have some guesses. Red-headed woodpecker, downy woodpecker. So there's two different species here. And notice they look almost identical. What the two in question are the hairy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker. It's very likely that you could, you could be getting both of these in your yard, okay? So how many people are voting hairy on the left? So if you put, uh, whoop, hairy on the left. So I see no, ha yes, hairy on left, yes. Okay, a lot of people coming in, yes, no, yes. It's pretty balanced, okay? So actually the bird on the left is the hairy. And the one on the right is the downy. And here's how you can tell them apart, okay? When, you, when you're looking out your window at your thistle feeder, okay, Margaret points out that the hairy is bigger. And that is true. The hairy is in fact bigger. However, when you see these birds by themselves, size is not a very good uh, indicator because size can be viewed relatively. So, in these two images, I stretched the downy to be equal size with the hairy. So we can't use body size. We have to use another feature. And Ilana is right on it. So if you do this exercise with me, if visually, if you take the bill of the hairy woodpecker and just visually, if you cut it off the face of the bird and slide it back, kind of like a cut and paste operation on a computer, we're gonna cut it off and we're gonna paste it and we're gonna put the tip of the bill where the base was, then you will see that that bill will extend well past the eye in the hairy woodpecker. In the downy woodpecker, if you do that same exercise, the bill does not, it, it extends just back to near the back of the eye, does not extend well past the eye. So that's a, a, a visual way of noting that the hairy woodpecker is proportionally longer build than the downy woodpecker, okay? That's one way to do it. And I'm gonna be honest with you, it takes time and practice to do this. You need your binoculars, you need to be looking at your suet cage as these birds go on there and uh, do that for practice and you need to compare lots of them. Here's another clue. If you look at the outer tail feathers in the hairy woodpecker, you'll see that they're clean white. The downy woodpecker has little black bars on its outer white tail feathers, okay? At least almost all downy woodpeckers have that. There are a few downy woodpeckers, um, rarely that are white, are completely white without the bars, okay? But that's a pretty reliable indicator if you think you've got a pretty long-billed bird and there's no black uh, uh, bars on the tail, then you've got a hairy woodpecker. Just as an aside, this red, this red spot on the head, what does that indicate if it's got a red spot on the head? It's a male, very good. That means it's a male, okay? If it lacks it, it's the female. I bet everybody has these in their yard, especially in the winter time. Chickadee, chickadee, dee, 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 dee. That's the sound. Chickadee, dee, 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 dee. Okay. They also go. <whistles> black cap chickadee. That's right. This is our uh, backyard chickadee, the black cap chickadee. If you go up into the White Mountains and go hiking up into the spruce fir forest over 4,000 feet, there's another species of chickadee up there called the boreal chickadee. But this is the black cap chickadee. How about this guy? He's fun. Deb points out that chickadee is also the Massachusetts state bird. Thank you, Deb. Okay, so a lot of you are chiming in that we have a nuthatch here. What kind of nuthatch? There's actually two types of nuthatch in Massachusetts. Could be white-breasted or red-breasted. 
white breasted or red breasted. Now people are chiming in, this is the white breasted and that is correct. So clean white chest, okay. The red breasted nut hatch looks, is much smaller. It looks shorter and compact um, and it has a black stripe through its eye. Okay, but this is the white breasted nut hatch, very good. Here's some eye candy. We already saw the Eastern Bluebird, so we know this is not the Eastern Bluebird. What is this? This is a real gem, right? Blue Cardinal, Indigo Bunting. Indigo Bunting. Yeah, that's right, guys. This is the Indigo Bunting, okay? Um, these uh, do come to feeders. Anybody have Indigo Buntings? Come to your feeders. Can you chime in and say yes or no if you, or just say yes if you've had indigo bunting? They're not super common. Where I grew up in Pennsylvania, they were much more common. Um, it, and um, Deb has indicated she hasn't seen one and that it's gorgeous. Well, I'm gonna tell you all, if you wanna see one, if you're handy with binoculars, a good place to go look for them is to go to a power line corridor place where there's a big wide swath cut out, all the trees are cut and there's power lines and then there's regenerating shrubby trees down below. They like the mix of different heights of trees, particularly the small trees, maybe 20 feet high. And then um, the, uh, the tall trees on the edge of the power line corridor is a great place to find indigo buntings, okay? And Kelly, I don't know how you get them. If I, if I knew how to get them, I'd get one too. Um, my home here in New Hampshire, I'm just not in the right habitat. And that's one thing to keep in mind for all of you is uh, habitat is key to, it's not just food for attracting the birds, it's the kind of habitat you have. If you don't have the right habitat, you can put the food out and they, they, won't, they won't come because they're just not there. So here we have the Northern Cardinal, nice, beautiful male, very red, okay? Everyone's familiar with this one. And we're gonna end on this guy, okay? This is, this is a sparrow, okay? And it's the sparrow that's most likely to be found bouncing around foraging and feeding in your mowed lawn. When you have a, a section of your yard that you mow, this is the sparrow in the summertime that's most likely to be bouncing around on it. Ah, Alejandro points out house sparrow. I should be careful. Depending on where you live, you could be overrun by house sparrows, sometimes called the English sparrows. Those are a non-native introduced sparrow. Um, they can be very common in shrubberies and hedges and things like that. Um, uh, but this bird, uh, is not a house sparrow. It's got a chestnut colored cap, clean white breast, and a black stripe through the eye. Looks very sleek. This is the chipping sparrow, okay? So if you're out with your binoculars, and I hope everyone will go out with your binoculars after this and look for some of these birds. Um, and if you have a, a lawn that you keep mowed, um, Look for this little brown guys. As birders, we often call these little brown jobs because they can be tough to identify and we get frustrated and we just say, oh, that's a little brown job. But see if you can figure out your little brown job on your yard. See if it's a, uh, um, uh, look for this chestnut colored cap and the black eye stripe and the little guy. And he sings with a, a real steady trill, okay? That's the chipping sparrow. So I want to thank everyone for bird watching with me tonight. Um, I hope you learned a few things and I hope you were entertained a little bit and uh, maybe inspired to get out those binoculars. You know, there are three things that I consider uh, to make uh, for someone to identify themselves as a bird watcher. First thing you need to be a bird watcher is you really do need binoculars. Okay, that's number one. You need binoculars. The second thing you need is a book, a field guide of the birds of your area. And if you don't have a book of the field guide of your area, I bet Jessica can help you find one. Okay. Yes, I can. 
Yeah, so the library certainly will have one. And then the third thing you need to be a birder is you have to use the first two things together. You need to use the binoculars and the bird book to kind of sort through and, and, and learn. And it really is kind of a, uh, uh, a scavenger hunt, if you will. Bird watching is really a lot about um, challenging yourself to find as many species as you can in a day life list of all the birds I have seen. I have like 780 in different species in my life and I'm always trying to find a new one and things like that. So I want to thank you. I hope this inspires you. I, I want to ask that if you enjoyed this presentation, you'd be sure to let Jessica know. And I do have other presentation titles here, Bizarre Birds of the World. Uh, Discoveries in Bird Migration is a new one that I do. Um, and you might find that uh, uh, very informative as well. So, but with that, um, I'm going to stop talking and we'll turn it over to Jessica to moderate uh, questions and I will try to answer as many as I can. Okay, so one of the questions that came through earlier, most of it is just thanking you so much for an excellent presentation, Steve. Um, it was really great. Um, thank the, you all. Do you have a recommendation for um, good beginning uh, binoculars? Okay, yeah. Well, so my recommendations are as follows. Um, in binoculars, very often price does matter, but you can get good binoculars for 50, between 50 and $100. And I think actually on Amazon, you might even be able to get decent binoculars for $35. Let me clarify that though. For $35 to $50, you can certainly get binoculars that will help you bring those birds up close but very often they are not hardy. That is, if you drop them or clank them, and when you take them out in the field, they do get roughed up. They might not last very long under those conditions. So, but if they do get roughed up and the mirrors get out of whack and you've, you've lost 35 to $50 rather than $500. Now a $500 binocular is going to be much more um, shock proof um, it's going to be anti-fogging and things like that and have other features. Uh, but if you're a beginner and you're interested to get out and look at some birds, I think you can get into a decent binocular for between 50 and $100. Okay, any tips on keeping squirrels off the feeders? <laughs> <laughs> I have one tip. Um, enjoy trying. Um, don't get too frustrated. No, that's not, I, ha I have a couple tips. One thing I've learned recently, and I learned this on Facebook, and maybe many of you are on Facebook, but I have these um, wrought iron shepherd's hooks things that I, that I hang uh, feeders from. And I actually use a slinky that I, I run over it. I attach it at the top with some tie downs. And then when the squirrels jump on the slinky, they just fall down to the ground and they get frustrated quickly. Unfortunately, the little chipmunks have figured out to crawl up within the cylinder of the slinky. So that hasn't uh, worked very well for, mm -hmm. for them. But overall, the gray squirrels, which are the pigs of the squirrel world, um, uh, they can't, they haven't seemed to work around my slinky suggestion yet. Okay. Good question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, is there any particular, going back to the binoculars, any particular brand that you like? So um, I'll tell you, so for my, for my um, guiding company, I, for guests who do not have their own binoculars, I have um, Bushnell Falcon 7x35. So the brand is Bushnell. Mm -hmm. It would be considered a low end binocular, $35. Um, they work pretty well. You have to take very good care of them, but they will work very well. For good binoculars, as we go up higher, usually the things manufactured by the Japanese or the Germans, um, um, optics manufacturers um, attract a lot of attention. So the best brands are things like Zeiss, Swarovski, Leupold, um, and then you start to get down into some of the Japanese ones, Jackson, Nikon, and things like that. Um, and then below that tend to be some of the American manufacturers like Vortex and Jason and, and stuff like that. So um, 
But all of those I've just named, the American ones, even though they're not quite as good as the other, they're still very good and, and will make you very happy on your bird watching endeavors. Is yeah. the pili oh sorry, is the pileated woodpecker common here? Yes. So I would say the pileated woodpecker is, uh, it's not as common as the others. I'm gonna, I'll honestly, I see or hear a pileated woodpecker at least once a week, mm -hmm. um, either flying over the road. Now I probably can identify it flying over the road maybe more readily than most. They are common around our area. Um, you should be able to find them. Can you explain to people what you should do if you find a baby bird on the ground? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. So I'm going to, I'm going to say uh, the scientist in me says to just leave that bird alone. Um, and of course there, it depends also on what you mean by a baby bird. So there's the naked baby bird that was either pushed out of its nest or fell out of its nest. It's still helpless and weak. There's really, you can, you can try to put that bird back. If you're, if you have the ability to put that bird back in the nest um, and you want to do that, I think you can do that. The adult will not reject that bird. Okay. Will not reject that baby bird. Um, but in the abs, otherwise um, the suggestions would be if you have access to a rehabilitator and you re and if you really want to try to help that bird, there's I have no objections to that either, but you would be best. And actually by law, legally, you would be bound to uh, take that bird, if you're not going to try and put it back in the nest, to take it to a re rehabilitator because you do not have the authority training to raise that bird on your own. Okay. Do you have time for just a few more? Yes. Okay. What drew you to study the Bicknell's thrush for your grad studies? Oh, wow. Very good okay. question. Um, so, so this is a little bit of a longer story, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Um, I recently had in, in the um, mid 1990s or early 1990s I'd moved to New Hampshire from uh, Louisiana I got my master's degree and I would I was hired as a bird observer for the White Mountain National Forest and I was hiking around and birding counting birds uh, for scientific purposes and at that time there was a lot of interest to know more about Bicknell's thrush a lot of questions about it because it was recently considered the same species as the gray cheek thrush. So I jumped in with a PhD project to try to understand more about the habitat, and how many Bicknell thrushes there were living on the White Mountains. Good question. Wow. Um, what, how do you identify a bird by hearing its sound? Okay, so um, no magic here. Just like you can identify people by their sounds, like that, our ears can be very discriminating. The fact that different species of birds make different sounds, just like uh, different species of mammals make different sounds. You can tell a dog from a cat from the sound it makes, and you can tell a dog from a lion. And I don't know what a kangaroo sounds like, but if I heard one, I could tell it apart from, from some of the other mammals. Well, birds, their song is species specific. When they're singing, you can tell um, the species by it. Other than that, when, when the question more proximally is how do you tell them by their sound, it takes lots of practice. Um, uh, and hiring, a, a good way is to hire a guide who can go out, so you practice on your own, and then you hire a guide to come out and help you check your knowledge and give you pointers in the field. Just listening to tapes or CDs, cassettes, and things online um, does not give you the full repertoire of the bird sounds that you're hearing um, in the field. You need to do both. Good question. Okay. This person has actually seen some mallard ducks in trees near her house, and she was wondering if that was normal behavior. Okay, so it would not be normal if they were mallards, but I'm going to bet 
um, uh, whoever's question it is, um, I'm going to ask you if you can go back there um, and try and look again and make sure they are not wood ducks that you're looking at. Wood ducks nest in trees and perch in trees. Mallards, I'm unaware of mallards being in trees. I could be wrong. Um, I, I'm not going to pretend to know everything. Wood duck would be far more likely. They also have a greenish head with some other markings. They're still distinctive from mallards. You go back to where you made that observation and see if you can't tell if they aren't actually wood ducks in the tree. Good question. Do you have any recommendations for a bird feeder? Um, no, actually, here's my recommendation. My recommendation is to get many different kinds of bird feeders to increase the diversity in your yard. Thank you for that question. So I have the tube feeder with black niger thistle, so I can feed the goldfinches, pine siskins, and red poles in the winter when they come. I have tray feeders. I also throw seed on the ground for the bigger birds that don't like to be on the trays and, and things like that. And you also want to um, move the feeders in different areas of the yard. So you want to have some low and some high. So the more diversity of ways you're feeding, the more diversity of birds you will have. Great. Um, have you ever participated in or helped coach anyone with the big year birding competition? I have not. <laughs> and I have never, I have never really seriously done a big year uh, or a big day uh, birding competition myself. So um, I am very familiar with, with them and I do have friends and, and things who, who, uh, who compete in, in those types of activities, but I do not. All right, that looks like um, the end of all of the questions. We did have a request for more about the birds in our yards here in Chelmsford, which I think you, you touched on a lot. Um, and we are really hoping to have Steve back uh, next spring um, for an actual bird walk locally when we can actually all get together and do something like that. So that will be located in Chelmsford. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah, that'll be great. So. Um, with that, I think uh, I think that's it. Thank you very much, Steve, for uh, for your generous um, for generous being so generous with your time and um, questions and everything. Um, it looks like everyone's really enjoyed it. Um, we do have uh, we have recorded this, and um, I will let everybody know when it's available. Um, but thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks for coming, and do go out and do some birding. It's a lot of fun. Great. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks to the Chelmsford Library.